And then these are some other examples. Now the reason why I want to show you these examples is that this no longer, so the data I showed you on the previous slide, these were for polystyrene beads. So anytime you're doing a dielectrophoretic measurement in the lab, the first thing that everyone does is a polystyrene bead. And the reason is because polystyrene beads are cheap, they're really easy to buy in uh, a variety of fluorescent configurations, and they're relatively simple. It's just a piece of plastic. And that piece of plastic has known properties, and it is just, and they're pretty close to spherical. And so in fact, a polystyrene bead should really match the models that we've discussed so far. And so you can't see all of this sigmoidal curve that I showed, right? I, I said it would be high and then it would go down low. You can't see that whole curve, but hopefully you can see parts of that curve in, in these data. Not if you agree with me. Okay, you need to make a sound because actually I can't see anyone well enough to see if they're nodding. Are any of you nodding? Okay, right on. Now we can't, we can't see the whole sigmoid. Why can't we see the whole sigmoid? Well, in fact, like there's no data, like this thing goes down to zero and then there's no more data over here. And the reason is because this experiment is, is a dielectrophoretic trapping experiment. So we're measuring how we can flow particles in and trap them. I can't measure the magnitude of a negative DEP response with this measurement. So this measurement only tells half the story. It tells the half of the story that's above zero. If I want to measure the part that's below zero, I have to do a DEP levitation experiment. Anyway, so we can't take all the data, but this, start, this follows that sigmoidal curve. If you look at this now, you see this looks more complicated. You see data that has one value, and then it seems to change, and then it changes again. Data that has one value, and then it changes, and it changes again. Now, why might, in this case, so this is for, this is data is for E. coli, and this data is for, I forget what this data is for. Do, 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 do. Oh, this is, so this is data for E. coli. We're comparing our data to data of uh, a different investigator. Here is our data for E. coli, both with and without a surfactant. So why might, in the case of a biological cell, might I expect to see something different than I saw for the polystyrene bead? It's true that the polarizability is different. So we see something that's different. But why specifically will I see something that starts out at one level, goes up, and then comes down? Whereas for a polystyrene bead, I really only saw one change. I saw something that went from high to low. It is true that you were seeing a, a small perturbation. Uh, and in the case of the polystyrene bead, that's largely explained by electrical double layer effects. So that complexity is induced by the fact that it's not just a polystyrene bead in water. It's a polystyrene bead surrounded by a thin, salty electrical double layer surrounded by bulk water. So is that the same case here as well? So he, here we have an electrical double layer, but we don't have to invoke the electrical double layer to explain why a, a biological cell might have a more complicated frequency structure than a polystyrene bead. Would it be the localization of like or other uh, cell membrane this property does not always uniform So so we don't have to uh, invoke specifically the fact that the membrane is non uniform, but it is directly related to the fact that there's a membrane and that membrane is a shell around this object and it's not just a sphere uh, surrounded by a medium. So, what's that? So there are, so it is true that there are parts of it that are slow to be polarized, um, and there, there are therefore are parts that are out of phase. Uh, and so all, all these things are intertwined. For the moment, I want to focus on the fact that this is changing in a couple different ways. So in fact, if I took this graph, this is a graph of the real part of the clausius mazzotti factor. So this real part of the clausius mazzotti factor looks a little bit like this. I don't show it up there, but we could infer, if we make some assumptions about physically what's going on here,
we could infer what the imaginary part of the quasi nazadi factor is. So we could infer that the imaginary part of the quasi nazadi factor looks like this. And so this relates to what may have been Calvin, but I can't see anything, talking about the, the phase lag. So we're getting a primarily real response here and here and here, here and here and here. So there's not a fit, lot of phase lag here. What we see is that at these different frequencies, we see a different magnitude of response. If we look, though, in these regions here and here, we see that the imaginary part of the clausius mazzotti factor is non-zero. And that's consistent with there being a significant fraction of the dipole that's responding to this electric field being now out of phase with the field. <coughs> So if you compare this, then, to what we see if we draw out the real part and the imaginary part of an individual sphere, a homogeneous sphere, I said it might look like something like this, where this is the imaginary part of the clausius mazzotti factor, and this is the real part of the clausius mazzotti factor. So when these systems are simple enough, we can look at these graphs and we can say, well, wait a second, every hump in the imaginary part of the clausius mazzotti factor is really telling us that something is happening. In this case, for a simple sphere, we really have one characteristic frequency associated with this system. That characteristic frequency is called the Maxwell-Wagner frequency. And this Maxwell-Wagner frequency is the characteristic frequency with which charge builds up at the interface. Now, that charge is building up at the interface as a function of two different things, right? We said that there was a, a permittive response where this particle polarizes and the medium polarizes instantaneously. And then on top of that, finite conductivity leads to ions approaching these interfaces. Both of these things were happening. The Maxwell-Wagner frequency characterizes the frequency where these two effects are basically approximately the same in magnitude. Now, for a simple sphere, there's only one interface. There's the interface between particle and medium. But if I take something that's more complicated, something that has two interfaces, I'll find that each interface has a characteristic frequency. So if I go over here and I say, now I'm going to have a cell, and this cell has a membrane and it has a nucleus, I have an interface on the outside of this membrane, an interface on the inside of this membrane, and an interface between the cytosol and the nucleus, and an interface between the inside of the, of the nuclear membrane and the nucleus. So now I have a whole bunch of different interfaces, and all of these interfaces have the potential to have different frequencies. Now, in the case of most cells that just have a membrane and a nucleus, you end up usually seeing two characteristic frequencies, because some of these different interfaces end up being redundant. And usually what this means is that you have one frequency that's relatively low frequency that corresponds to the outside interface. And then this is a characteristic frequency that corresponds to the inside interface. And the locations of these different interfaces in frequency space varies depending on what the properties are. If you took, if you take a biological cell, you tend to get one answer. If you took a plastic material with a metallic shell or this and that, there you can get all sorts of different answers. But the basic thing I want you to take from this is because the physical structure of a biological cell is more complicated than a polystyrene bead, I also see a response in frequency space that's more complicated. And in general, for biological cells, you'll see at least two characteristic frequencies associated with the inside and the outside of the cell. Yes, sir. Uh, 
can you go over the, the, the frequency again? So it's describing the frequency of the interface. Which, which forces are equal at this end? So, um, the Maxwell Wagner frequency is not precisely defined by a force balance. Rather, we have, if you look at that curve, it's meant to be a sigmoid going from some high number to some low number. The magnitude of the high number and the magnitude of the low number may not be the same. Let's suppose for simplicity that they were. So let's suppose that the clausius mazzotti factor went from one half, from plus one half to minus one half. Then the center of that distribution would be right where it crosses zero. And that center would both be the crossover frequency, which would be where it changes from positive DEP to negative DEP. And it would also be the Maxwell Wagner frequency. And the Maxwell Wagner frequency is basically the midpoint in frequency space of how this changes from a purely, in this case, ohmic response to a purely reactive. Uh, electrical permittivity type response, a polarization response. Now, if this goes from, say, 1 to minus 1 half, then the Maxwell Wagner frequency will be when, it go, when it's halfway in between. So it would be when it's a plus a quarter. And that wouldn't be exactly the same as the crossover frequency. So the crossover frequency tells you a balance of forces. The Maxwell Wagner frequency tells you the frequency at which you're halfway in going from one mode to another mode, if that makes any sense. Yeah, right on. I will, I assure you, I will give you lots of homework problems where I'll ask you to characterize it, or ask you to calculate it. Yes? Would you say that you could characterize maximum Wagner frequency as like a local maximum or minimum of imaginary values? Ah, the Maxwell Wagner frequency is for a system that has a single mode, a single relaxation, the Maxwell Wagner frequency is precisely equal to the peak of the imaginary part of the clausius mazzotti factor. That's not, you can't say that that's strictly correct as soon as you have two different modes.